As a white female educator who identifies a, as a feminist, Karen will share her perspective on how white feminists can support inter intersectionality. It is only when the most marginalized are free that we are all free. And I'm the president, I'm not the president, I'm sorry, I'm the vice president. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm the vice president of the Feminist Coalition. We're a really awesome group who is intersectional, who is hoping to support everyone and everything. And we're meeting on Thursdays and S246. Um, and it's really awesome, and you guys should come. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. So thanks to Emco and Women's Center um, for this opportunity. So um, I'll be talking a little bit about white feminism and the challenge of intersectionality. Okay. So have you seen this picture before? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is an image that went viral. Oh, thank you so much. That's much better. Um, this is an image that went viral um, after the Women's March a year ago. So I would, um, if you haven't seen it before, you need a moment to to um, to read it, as we would say in the English department. <laughs> so um, this is uh, we're going to start right away with some open discussion. So what are some things that you notice in this picture? Yeah. Uh, she's like. I mean, if you take some time, you can see, I think, one other black woman, but like, she's the only black woman of color that I can really there see. There was two. There's another one there. Oh, there is. Okay. So <laughs> you're talking about the, the woman still, here still. and then a woman yeah, yeah, yeah. behind her. Okay. Is there another one? No, just one right here. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Okay. It's still yeah. only two. It's still only two, and then it's, and then there's like this uh, vapidity to it where, uh, like, she's, she looks super badass. Uh, and then there are these three white women on these pedestals wearing uh, pussy hats, taking selfies. And that sort of also creates a distance between like, damn, I'm super cool, and oh, I'm going to take a selfie. And this sort of understanding of what resistance can or should be. Excellent. That's a great. That's great. That's great. Let's keep going. Go ahead. You had your hand up. Oh, so I was, I was mimicking. Oh. Okay. White girl. <laughs> but it's it's just frustrating. It's it's incredibly infuriating, um, because because it's not only speaking to how selfish white women can be in this context, but also how selfish our society tends to be in trying to prove that we are we, we stand for something only because we put it on our social media versus actually standing up and saying and educating yourself on the history and the context of the situation that we're talking about. Okay, excellent, excellent. Does anyone else want to add um, any reading of the image here? So I'll let you keep looking at it and I'm just gonna read to you um, a statement uh, by um, uh, uh, describing the image, and then I'm going to actually, um, this uh, woman was interviewed, um, and she was asked, um, what would you say to the three white women behind her? So I was really excited to find that quote. Um, okay, so um, also, uh, you can't see it from this side, but um, this woman's hat says, stop killing black people. Okay, so just putting that out there. Okay. So um, an article in USA Today that came out right after the Women's March a year ago um, said, to many, the now viral image of a sober-looking Angela Peoples, so this is Angela Peoples, and the blithe faces of the white women behind her epitomize a divide between white women and black women that was unmistakable in the 2016 election. More than 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump while nearly 94% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. The split signals how these groups experience sexism and oppression differently. So then it says USA Today spoke with Angela Peoples, uh, the director of Get Equal, an LGBTQ equality organization. And I just want to read this, this one piece to you. So the interviewer asked Angela Peoples, what would you say to the women standing behind you, meaning these three women in the photo. And she said, 
I would say 53% of white women voted for him. Someone in your family voted for him. Someone you are friends with voted for him. And that put my life and my family's life in greater danger. So go talk to your family and talk to your friends and move them away from that ideology. It's less about showing up and standing in solidarity with folks of color or immigrants and more about actually doing the work in your communities to change some hearts and minds. If someone says a racial slur or says something and you're like, I can't believe they said that, actually say something um, <laughs> that out loud to them. Do not normalize xenophobia. Do not normalize anti-blackness. Do not normalize transphobia. Take a step back and analyze why it's there. Okay, so again, she was interviewed afterwards. What would she say to those women? After seeing the photograph, what would she say to those women behind her? Does anyone want to add anything to your observations about the image? Tubby. You may, this may not be a fair question. Um, was it, see I'm getting defensive. Was it 53% <laughs> was it of white women voted for Trump or 53% of the white women who voted? It's got to be the white women who voted, voted for Trump. Because I don't think 53% of women voted, did they? It was a low turnout. The turnout was really low. Yeah. Right, it was a turnout low. So, um, that's so a great So if question. you were a white woman and went to the polls, 53%, okay. That's, that's still not good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, it's problematic to say the least. Okay, so um, what I would like to get at is that this image is not just about 2016. That this image has more than 150 years of history buried in it. So there's layer upon layer upon layer. And so what I would like to do is for us to kind of peel back just a couple of those layers. So I will ever so lightly be touching upon a few um, historical touchstones. So I'm not a historian, for those of you in the room that are, feel free to chime in um, because many of you are more aware of some of these details than I am. So again, we're just kind of Going, um, going into some of these touchstones. So we are going way back to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Okay, so um, so how, how are you familiar with Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Yes. Some nods, yes. some, some <laughs> not so nods. Okay, so um, one thing to think about is women's history, generally, even white women's history is not, is not taught widely, okay? So um, you might only have encountered this name if you had taken a women's studies or gender studies class here or in high school. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, that there's, again, multiple levels here. Um, but just to say a little bit about why um, I'm starting with her. So um, she attended, so she's known as a significant um, women's rights activist. Okay, she attended, we're in 1840 in London, she attended an anti-slavery convention, okay? However, women at the convention were not allowed to speak, literally not allowed to speak, okay? And so, not surprisingly, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the other women there were very upset about <laughs> being silenced at a convention that is, in theory, about silencing and oppression, right? Okay, so she, um, she lives in Seneca Falls, New York. She comes back. And that experience is one of the experiences that prompted her to, um, to actually um, create a women's rights convention in New York with other people, okay, not obviously by herself. And so um, in 1848, um, at this convention, a document called the Declaration of Sentiments, some of the language I hope is going to sound a little familiar, um, was uh, created by Stanton and the other activists, who were both men and women. Um, I'd love to have somebody read this out loud. I don't, how well can you guys see this? Great, so um, can I have a volunteer read again? So the quote directly from the Declaration of, of Sentiments. Was she right there, do it. So who would like to read this out loud? I've already said something, I'll wait for other people. <laughs> the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. Okay, great. Thank you, Brandon. No problem. Um, does some of the language in here sound like a relatively famous historical document? 
What document might that be? It starts with the same word. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> This also sounds a lot like uh, sort of the way that church would speak. The way that? Uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists would speak. Okay, uh, very interesting. Excellent, excellent. Um, so there's, is the language is very, very specific about man and about woman. Right. Yeah. Okay, and not about there being sort of any sense of, right. of um, fluidity, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, absolutely. And so that, that leads us to your point, well, who is woman? Um, interestingly here, it's singular, okay? Um, and then who is getting ignored here, okay? So one of the things that um, I found out that um, when I uh, was in grad school and studying some of this that I thought was really interesting, um, this, the indigenous Seneca community that was just down the street from where Elizabeth Cady Stanton lived, they had just passed um, a, a constitution giving voting rights to men and women, okay, in the 1840s, okay. Stanton was likely completely unaware of that, and even if somebody had told her about it, it's hard to say that she would have really necessarily acknowledged that, okay. So to her, this is coming out as a brand new concept, okay, the first of its kind. All right, even though this is happening <laughs> within miles. All right, and then also in this, and this is getting to your point, um, we might start to think about how whiteness, middle class status, heterosexual identity, these kinds of identities might actually be normalized here. Okay, and we can see that if we jump ahead just a couple of years to Sojourner Truth. Does that name sound familiar? Yes. Okay, excellent. So she um, was a slave who then became a prominent activist, um, both anti-slavery and women's rights. And uh, at the Women's Rights Convention in 1851, um, gave a speech, um, Ain't I a Woman? Okay, it's been, um, Bell Hooks and many others have kind of re, you know, um, raised up this um, this title and this, and this concept. So you've probably seen it, um, here and there. I'd love to have another volunteer. Again, this is um, just a small piece of her speech. Does somebody want to read that for us? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages <laughs> or over mud runners or gives me any best place. Well, ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? Okay, great. Thanks, Lynn. So when she's talking about the man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages, who are the women she's talking about? White, white, white women. women. And middle class affluent. And middle class, right? So it's other. that whole normalized identity, okay? But she's obviously coming in and saying, well, wait a second, I'm a woman too, but yet I'm being excluded from that, that definition. Okay, so again, we're starting to peel back. Remember the photo we just looked at from 2016? All of these layers are buried in here. Okay, we're going to jump a bit, not yet to the present, but we're jumping a bit to Ida B. Wells. Um, is she someone who's familiar to? There's some nods. Okay, so um, she uh, was a black woman who was an anti lynching activist, among many other things. Um, at the turn of the previous century. Um, and uh, so the, the moment I want us to look at here is in 1913, so this is before women got the right to vote, um, and suffrage means the right to vote, it doesn't mean to suffer. Students have made this um, mistake many times, and I just want to be really clear about that. Suffrage does not mean suffering, it means voting. Okay, so a suffrage parade was scheduled in Washington, D.C., um, to support women's right to vote. You might think, oh, great, super, wonderful. Okay, so <laughs> Ida B. Wells is like, oh, great, let's, let's go. Um, but white women activists told Wells that black women had to march in the back of the parade in a segregated section. Okay, so again, a parade ostensibly about resisting oppression 
is yet reinforcing another oppression. Okay, so do you see the pattern that's <laughs> emerging here? Um, and we have a statement from, from Wells herself here. Would somebody like to read that for us? How about a student? I was going to say that. <laughs> or a provost. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one. <laughs> I'll read it. <laughs> Either I go with you or not at all. I am not taking the stand because I personally wish for recognition. I'm doing it for the future benefit of my whole race. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, what do you think she did at the parade? I hope she walked with the white women. Mm -hmm. So she refused to march in the back of the parade and, and marched. Um, actually, there was some so there were some white women that were supporting her and some, some white women that were not, you know, not, not a shock. But she refused to march in the back of the parade. Okay, we're gonna jump again several decades. Okay, since we don't have that much time. Um, uh, so now it's 1982. We've had the civil rights movement, 60s. We've had the women's movement of 60s and 70s. Um, yet here we are, 1982. Um, the title here is really important. I want us to spend a moment um, close reading it because again, I'm an English professor. <laughs> um, all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave black women's studies. So this was revolutionary in 1982. Okay, so let's, we're going to go back again to this title. All the women are white, all the blacks are men. So this is an anthology, just to be clear, it's not one person, it's a group of, um, a group of editors. Okay. What do you think they're saying with that title? All the women are white, all the blacks are men. Yeah. When we think of women, we think of white women. When we think of black people, we think of black men. Uh, and that's pretty much true today. Like, not much has changed, hopefully. So we default to whatever identity is the dominant, normalized identity. Okay, so again, the top one is more about the women's movement. The second one is more about the civil rights movement. And so the black women and other women of color that are creating this anthology and editing it are, again, speaking out that the same thing that their ancestors have been speaking about. All right. Um, okay. I also just want to, on a side note, and give a plug to the library. Um, mention that there were several anthologies that came out in the 80s and 90s that kept reinforcing this, um, that this idea. So uh, another one that was just one year before, this is an updated one, um, but this bridge called My Back um, that Gloria and Zaldua helped to put together. I don't know if that's familiar to anybody. Um, I checked these out myself, but I will be returning them this afternoon and encourage you to check them out. Um, and I can pass these around as well. And so um, these are, again, uh, women of color identified uh, who self-identify um, as radical, as feminist, really trying to focus on the, um, the way that the women's movement and the civil rights movement has essentially excluded them. So uh, a decade later, in 1990, Making Face, Making Soul, also edited by Gloria Anzaldúa. Okay, I'll just pass that around. And then again, um, Gloria Anzaldúa and here Anna Louise Keating in um, 2002, this bridge we call home. Okay, so each one is sort of a different um, decade, but it's the same theme. It is the same exact theme. And the fact that these are anthologies meant that there could be a wide variety of contributors expressing a wide variety of, um, of perspectives here. Okay, and so for me, um, I was in college and then grad school in the 90s. Um, this kind of work was profoundly influential to me, especially since I was taking classes um, by, from women of color that were really, really engaged in this work. So for me, this, this is a material that um, 
was probably one of my first entry points into, into this work. Okay, so, um, who, who is this? Kimberly Crenshaw, okay. So, this is um, just an image from her TED Talk that was um, done in 2016. So Kimberly Crenshaw is a legal scholar, activist, feminist. Um, she is affiliated with both UCLA Law School and Columbia. Um, and so she became very, very uh, well known with her term intersectionality. Okay, so when do you think she came up with the term intersectionality? So this is 2016. When do you think she came up with that term? So it goes back to 1989. <laughs> so she published an article that introduced the term intersectionality all the way back in 1989. It only took a couple of decades for it to kind of get out there. All right, but I do want to spend a moment here um, highlighting a couple of things. Um, so yes, this is a law review article with <laughs> more footnotes than um, even I can really manage, all right? But, um, but the, the concept here is that she is really introducing some extremely important ideas that connect to the kind of um, peeling back of that photo that we started out with. So if we take a look at her title, let's just start with the, the word demarginalizing. So what do you think that means, um, to demarginalize? De well, what's up? What are the margins? Where are the margins? The edges. Exactly. Exactly. So if margins are on the edges, what does it mean to demarginalize? Bring it into the forefront. Yeah, to center it. To center what had been marginalized. Okay? And then here, the intersection of race and sex. So one of the things that she talks about in this article is what she calls the problem of, quote, single axis analysis. Okay? And so a single axis, A-X-I-S, single axis, okay, would be only race, only sex, not both. <coughs> so this is where the idea of the intersection comes from. So an axis is just essentially one line, right? I mean, I'm not a bath professor, but it is it's one line, okay? And it's only, you're making a choice. You're looking at either race or sex. But the intersection is where they converge, where they cross. Okay, so she talks about the problem of a single axis analysis and instead advocates for intersectionality. All right, and I want to just um, say a little bit about, so I'm just going to read you a, a, little, um, a little blurb from her, her essay. And she talks about um, the problem of an analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular manner in which black women are subordinated. Okay, and she gives um, an example that I find really helpful. Um, again, I don't know too much about some of these very specific law cases, but this example um, I just I found really helpful. So this is a court case um, where five black women sued General Motors. Okay, so again, this is a while ago, but five black women sued General Motors, and um, the case was called. Um, to Graf and Reed versus General Motors. Okay, so I'll just read you her blurb here. In De Graf and Reed, five black women brought suit against General Motors, alleging that the employer's seniority system perpetuated the effects of past discrimination against black women. Evidence adduced at trial revealed that General Motors simply did not hire black women prior to 1964 and that all of the black women hired after 1970 lost their jobs in a seniority-based layoff during a subsequent recession. 
Okay, so that evidence seems pretty clear. Not hiring black women until a certain point and then firing them all in this um, sort of wide sweeping layoff. Okay, however, so you would think, oh, that must be, you know, fairly basic grounds for winning this lawsuit. Well, hold that thought, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so um, Crenshaw goes on to say, because General Motors did hire women, albeit white women, during the period that no black women were hired, there was, in the court's view, no sex discrimination that the seniority system could conceivably have perpetuated. So because the um, General Motors didn't fire all women, the black women could not sue on the basis of sex discrimination. And then you might be anticipating this next piece. Um, because not all black employees were fired, the court found they could not sue on the basis of race discrimination. Okay, and then the court refused to consider the intersection of race discrimination and sex discrimination. So the black women lost their case. <laughs> so I'm not sure what level court this was. Um, that's a great question. Google worthy, I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. So her article is actually available um, through Open Resource. I'm making fun here, but it's available through <laughs> Open Resource, and it's called "Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex." Okay, so it's not illegally uploaded. Don't worry, um, it is available. There's a little statement about about that. So so check it out. I mean, some really interesting stuff here. Um, okay, so. What gets ignored today when feminism is not intersectional? So a couple of things to think about, and then we'll have time for some, some larger discussion. So the wage gap, for one. Um, often we hear, oh, well, I, you know, women make 75 cents, 76 cents to every dollar a man makes. Well, again, if we peel back those layers, it's a lot more complicated than that. White women earn 76 cents to every dollar a white man makes. But African American women earn 62 cents. American Indian women, and this is the language from the, um, the survey, American Indian women earn 58 cents, and Latinas earn 54 cents. So again, once we actually do an intersectional analysis, we can see that there's some extremely significant um, differences here. And so that is from the AAUW. Something else, um, another crisis that is um, occurring today is the difference in uh, uh, maternal mortality. Okay, so black, I'll just read the quote down here, black moms across the US are three and a half times more likely to die in childbirth than white women in the US. Okay, and this has gotten worse over the, you know, since um, over the past few years. Okay, you may have seen um, sir, about Serena Williams' recent experience where the doctor, she was in an extremely um, serious health crisis after having a child. The doctors didn't really believe her. She could have died. Okay, I mean, she didn't. Um, she finally convinced them about her specific um, situation. But, you know, again, this is perpetuating the same sort of um, system that we've seen in the past century and a half. And a lot of this comes back to sort of who is believed, who is considered fully human, right? Because that's built into this racial ideology. Another um, crisis that we're at is life expectancy. Trans women of color, life expectancy is only 35 years, whereas white women is 81 years. That gap, um, that gap is huge. Okay, and there I have, um, if you want to know more about that, I have some additional resources and we'll make this available. Okay, so what can white feminists do to develop a more intersectional approach? So um, there's a lot, a lot that needs to happen, right? Critiquing white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, heterosexism, 
critiquing multiple oppressions at the same time and not saying I'm only going to focus on one form of oppression because doing that is usually at the expense of another form of oppression. Um, I believe that white women need to really look in the mirror and think about how are we complicit in white supremacy, both on a larger structural level but also on an individual daily level. Um, I think white women need to learn that whiteness is a social construct and whiteness was invented for a purpose and a reason that relates to power and control and dividing and conquering um, and that we are obligated to learn that history. And to keep asking, if feminism is reinforcing oppression, is it feminism? Um, I believe we need to recognize that it is only when the most marginalized are free that we are all free. And then um, on something a little bit more tangible, I added the relatively recent hashtag, Black Women Lead. So a lot of um, black candidates, uh, black female candidates, are using this hashtag and some of the organizations that are supporting them. Um, so this is sort of one specific initiative to support um, black women running for, especially running for office, um, both at the local and at um, state levels. And then I humbly offer <laughs> my book. Um, I, it has uh, a lot of different um, strategies, but also it's an introduction to understanding, um, in the US at least, the history of race and racism with tools for action. So um, both you know, on campus, but also in the community, I interact with a lot of white women who um, had no idea that race was a social construct. Okay, women that are considered well-educated, professional women um, my age. And much of this was new to them because much of this is just not taught unless you look for it. All right, so I think one of the things that at least um, that the white women can do is to work on educating other white women because women of color should not bear the burden of educating white people that racism exists. And that, that's another extremely critical point here. So I would like to thank the Women's Center. I would like to thank FEMCO. Um, I have various things that you can <laughs> reach me at. Um, so I'll just leave that up there. But why don't we, um, we have some time, I think, for some discussion and comments. So. Um, can I just say, so as we switch over to Q&A, um, Almost everybody got a survey. It would be really great if you sneak out any time. Just fill out your survey, and you can put it anonymously in the envelope right by the door. And then there are flyers around for our talk for next week. So we're still in this week, but if anybody needs to sneak out, just make sure you check those things out.